What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Mount Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. Wiki. Yo. Yo, what's up? Dude, we're doing this intro right after we just talked to This Esther. is unheard of. This is this is insane because my brain isn't dead yet at the end of our podcast day. Yeah. No, I know. Typically, we do all of our intros at the end of the day after recording four interviews, and then we go back and go, what did we talk about on that episode again? But we're actually recording this intro right after we recorded the intro so, uh, interview. So we should be able to like totally say everything that Esther just told us. Of course. Go. Right? You go first. Well, first of all, you just hinted at who we're talking to. Oh, oh by yes. the way, you're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast. If we didn't tell you that, you didn't pick that up from our intro. Surprise! Surprise. This is the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast. I'm Matt Wolf. My co-host is Joe Fear. Wow. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're talking to Esther Kiss. That that dude. Are, are you trying to be a polished radio broadcaster? I am. Because we're trying to get syndicated on the radio. We're actually not yet, but because we're too filthy for that too filthy <laughs> <laughs> they'd have to bleep way too many things we'd be fined fifty thousand dollars a pop yeah we'd have to get a lot cleaner with how we talk if we want to be on the radio <laughs> felt like there was a pretty clean episode this one though it was yeah all right so esther kiss is totally amazing uh she she's just deep into the the publicity world the pr world in all sorts of facets with podcasting, TV, radio, uh, all the online publications, magazines, stuff like that. And this was a total, you know, we talked about PR before with uh, Andrew O'Brien, mm -hmm. good buddy of ours. We took a totally different angle with Esther. And, uh, you know, like, so both of these episodes, I, I feel like, can stand alone and be really well, like, if you just kind of combined what each yeah, are saying. Yeah, yeah. With this one, you know, we really dug into um, how to get on podcasts, how to approach the podcasters, um, what kind of things you can do to help podcasters out so they'd be actually interested in having you. Uh, we talk about how to get into radio, how to get mm -hmm. on TV, how to get on national TV. How to talk in sound bites. How to so talk that's in good sound for bites. radio and TV. Yeah, yeah, so if you are going to go on TV, this is, you know, we got some some pointers on how to present when you go on TV. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about uh, the, the, the podcasting world and what... what kind of things are coming up in podcasting talked about those scams out there of getting onto forbes and yes. all these big publications don't I, go don't pay. do it <laughs> yeah because uh we almost got taken a little bit yeah uh, by a few people but um yeah don't do it yeah don't go <laughs> don't go pay to get on uh <laughs> on like news sites like forbes and stuff yeah um unless you're actually purchasing advertising which is a different story That's different yeah but uh, don't if somebody approaches you and says hey for x amount of money we'll get you on forbes don't do it yeah. esther will tell you why when we get into this episode <laughs> so uh, yeah we what would you get? Go ahead. I was going to go ahead and start pitching our newsletter and our companions, but oh, go ahead gonna, and say what you're going to say. You can pitch me on that newsletter here. I'll, I'll grade you. So it's well, just like you're pitching to a PR agency or something. Oh, or now you're news, putting me news. on the spot? Yeah. All it. right. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're enjoying what you're listening to, uh, you probably want to take some notes on it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are so. you you want to take notes? I'm nodding my head. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, but the problem is you're probably driving, you're probably doing dishes, you're, if you're like me, you're walking your dog, you're, you're not doing something dog that's right making it difficult for you to take notes right now. Don't worry, we've got you covered. Yes. If you go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, C-O-M-P, then we are going to hook you up with the notes from this episode. We take notes on these episodes and we share those notes with you. So any sort of tools, tips, tactics, strategies, uh, other podcasts, people's names, all of that kind of Quick stuff. Takeaways, is, all takeaways, action oriented. Yes, uh, we take aggressive wisdom. notes. Aggressively, aggressive notes. They, there's there's papers torn. There's there's punches being thrown. But damn it, those no, notes are basically they should be printed on gold. They should They're that good. Yes, but we you can go them get them much. for free if you act fast. If you go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, you can get the notes for this episode, assuming you're getting the notes the week this episode was released. Ooh. The way our notes work is they're limited. They, they, have a, they have a lifespan. Gotta be quick. If you get them the week that this episode comes out, they're free. <laughs> are we both touching and talking in pitch voices right now? Yes, we are. Ooh, radio voice now. All right, so everybody go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp. C-O-M-P. Comp. Extra. All right. Let's go talk to Esther Kiss. This is a badass episode. Dang it. I broke a no cussing. Some people might consider I, ass a cuss, right? I think that's allowed on the radio. Maybe not in the deep south of America because yeah. there's some different regulations. I, I don't know. All right. I'll take well, that up with the FTC later. Well, let's go talk to <laughs> Esther because this is some killer info. Killer. Hey, Esther. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you... Yeah, we... 
I forget. Was it Rob Burns that connected us? I believe. I yes. So. Yes. <laughs> or I think reconnected us because like I remember when we chatted and I was like, I just feel like you're so familiar. I'm sure we met each other. Somewhere. Sam actually. Sam Riley did one of my past clients and Facebook Messenger, and then we never yes. got around to actually setting up a chat. But then when Rob introduced us also through email, then we were like, okay, now we got to talk. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think we've sort of <laughs> chatted in the past through email and things like that, just because you know Joe and I have been podcasting since 2010, so. I know you work with a lot of people in the podcasting world, so there's no doubt we've crossed paths a few times over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now, I mean, I'm sure you're busy with all the podcasts out there because, <laughs> yeah, I know we get introduced to all sorts of people, but it's probably a, is it a booming time for you in the podcast kind of PR space? Yeah, you know, it's something that has been around for, I think, about 15 years now, but over the last six five, six years, it's grown a lot. And particularly in the online marketing entrepreneurship space, there's just so many shows. And that's a very, very strong component of the work I do as well. We don't only do podcast bookings for mm -hmm. our clients. We also do traditional media. Mm -hmm. But especially for clients who have niche businesses, podcasts are incredible. They really help you build a strong relationship with your audience. And, and it's great, uh, you know, for leads and sales as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm curious. Let's, let's kind of take our audience back a little bit and kind of hear how you got started and how you evolved into this world of helping people get PR and get on podcasts and, and all the stuff you're doing now. What were you doing before this and how did you kind of get into this world? Yeah, I'm a very curious kind of person. So I think that questioning nature <laughs> led me literally quite around the world. I lived in six other countries before I moved to the U.S. 12 oh. years ago. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and my background is in business development and marketing. And um, I was doing acting at the time when I first moved here. I uh, moved to Los Angeles for an acting school. And you know how they always say that out-of-work actors are always waiters. Ah, so yeah. I really didn't want to do that. I'm like, oh, what can I do? <laughs> But, well, but I actually looked up and it looks like you did some stage combat acting. Is that true? A little bit, yeah. yeah. I, how does find that, that. I was just really curious. Like, yeah, I don't want to throw, throw you off, but like, how does that work really fast? Like, well, it's basically choreographed movements like fencing and things like that, which I wouldn't know anymore how to do today. Okay. But basically, it's like a dance where mm. it looks like you're doing some kind of combat. But. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> All right. You can yeah. keep going. <laughs> so, you know, and, and obviously, it's, especially when you're still in acting school or just out, it's, it's very hard to actually make a living as a beginning actor. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I can go back to my roots in business. And initially, what I was doing was day trading. So stock trading really early in the morning, because on the West Coast, of course, it's three hours uh, behind New York. So I was just you know, I would get up like at 5, 5.30, 6 a.m., read the news, do some trading in the morning. And that let me be available and free during the day for auditions or filming or whatever I had going on. Mm -hmm. And um, that went really well until the recession hit. And then I was like, wow. oh, no, yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And so I started to actually just in the beginning grabbing anything I could, you know, as a freelancer and really trying to figure out what to do. So I was doing subtitles for the movies and teaching Hungarian and like all these different things things. And I started taking on coaching clients and helping them with what I knew, which is marketing and, and how to grow a business. And I, um, at the beginning, it was it was good, but I always attracted beginners, uh, mm -hmm. people who are in completely in the startup phase. And I really wanted to connect with entrepreneurs who are successful, who are at a high level, who I've worked with previously before I moved to the US, you know, like those types of uh, people who have written New York Times bestselling books or built like really successful businesses. And so I had a brilliant idea with a really good friend of mine, Meta Miller. We said that, why don't we start a show and we can start interviewing these guys and start building those relationships. I don't know what I'm going to do as a business, but I know that we need to start with building those relationships out first. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we, you know, we had people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Perry Marshall and John Benson, like all the big guys um, on the show. And every time we would do an interview at the end, I would say that, hey, I know you have this uh, book coming out or you have this event. Would you like to be on other shows as well? And they always said yes. So I started connecting them and introducing them to other podcasters and, you know, making these uh, introductions for them to help them get even more exposure and not charging anything for it, just completely for free to help out and mm -hmm. to invest in the relationship. 
And then one of my clients came to me who was doing Facebook ads for an author. And he says that, hey, here's this author who is a best-selling author already. Can you help him get on some shows, some podcasts? And I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, yeah, but this time you have to charge for it. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, okay, fine, I guess. Yes. (laughs) So literally, I went on Google, like, how much does a publicist charge? You know? Ah, wow. <laughs> and it turned into this thing where now I work with really some of the biggest names in our industry, like Ryan Levesque and Gary Vaynerchuk, and like a lot of up-and-coming thought leaders as well. And we help them get in, in the right media to help them share their message in a bigger way. That's super cool. What What did you, I'm curious, what you charged when you first started? What was the number? Oh, I started at the high end. <laughs> oh, you did? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you can, why not? But also, it's because it's very much tied with my clients. It's very much tied into direct response, so they really can see the results. Yeah. So I started right away at you know five figures some per month. So you always did you always have that angle of hey, I'm going to figure out publicity and direct response together. Yeah, I mean, because my background is in marketing and, yeah. and business development previous to this, I had a base, like basic, like a, a pretty good knowledge of, of marketing. I didn't know direct response, but I learned as I went along. And then the other thing too is uh, I really, really enjoy these conversations. And really, my superpower is connecting with people. Mm-hmm. And so this is just a practical application of it, of you know, saying hello, making new friends, making introductions. Sure. That's basically all I'm doing. <laughs> it's kind of like reverse gossip, you know. Instead of talking badly about someone behind their back, I talk really good about them <laughs> <laughs> to the public <laughs> on shows. And, yeah, no, it's perfect, and that's cool that you approach it with that combo in mind. Because I mean, that's. Matt and I, like, we have this kind of odd mission, but not really too odd, but this, like, hey, we want to take podcasting and, like, bridge the gap between digital marketing and podcasting, and, you know, I feel like we do it pretty well, but there's a lot of folks that just don't know how to make that connection, especially if they're getting publicity, like, going on other shows or even, like, getting featured in something like Fortune or Entrepreneur. So maybe, mm-hmm. can you talk about that, like, some of the ways that you connect the two, direct response and uh, publicity? Yeah, so that that ties into really understanding, first of all, what your goal is with your publicity campaign. For example, if it's for a book launch, that's something where you would plan way ahead of time, like three to four months minimum. But if it's a New York Times bestselling campaign or something really big, six, seven months is easy, depending on where you're at, where you're starting, how big your platform is. It could be as long as a year that you start planning ahead and understanding what do I want? Do I want to uh, ramp up pre-orders for my book or do I want to have this publicity and being featured in Forbes and Inc and entrepreneur wherever TV you know um, for the reason that I want to have more credibility with my market and I want to have those cool logos on my website at Essena and ABC and mm-hmm. NBC those are good too you know mm-hmm. it really helps because the nice thing is that it helps with conversions at every single point throughout your funnel it shortens your sales cycle it builds more trust it's, it brings more people to you so it, it's not something where you necessarily can measure it like a very, very well-tracked funnel with the Facebook ads, you know, mm-hmm. where you can say to the penny that this is what I spend this. It's it's more comparable to, you know, when you start dating someone and at some point, you know, that you really like this person and you want to be in a relationship with them or you want to marry them. It's not like you knew that, oh my goodness, the way they smile on that particular occasion, that's what <laughs> threw me over the edge. That, that's not how it works. But overall, the mm-hmm. cumulative effect is something that we've seen with multiple seven and eight figure businesses where, for example, with articles like Entrepreneur or Forbes or Inc., any of those big name publications, they would use those articles as content in their ads and mm-hmm. retarget the leads that they have with those uh, content pieces where basically in the in the person's mind, it's like, well, I've seen this on the news or I read this article. Maybe there was a TV clip that they turned into a video ad. And those kinds of conversions take client acquisition costs down by as much as 90%. And this works across the board, whether you are doing a free plus shipping book funnel or you're selling really expensive six-figure services. Like some of my clients sell this stuff like literally with a f- one phone call and one email because they use these publicity pieces to warm up that audience and mm. put ad dollars behind it to, to put it in front of the right people. Got it. So how, so walk us through like specifics of how that looks. Are you using things like Facebook ads and promoting like an article or, or like a clip, like you said, like a video clip and promoting that on all these different channels? 
Yes. So uh, just to be very, very clear, Facebook ads are not my expertise. Mm -hmm. This is something where I help my clients with the strategy and what they can do with the specific pieces that we got for them. Got so when I start working with somebody, they, let's say, uh, they tell me this is the message, this is the goal, this is what they want to accomplish. Let's say we get them on a couple of TV shows, we get them featured in Forbes and Article and, uh, you know, Inc., those kinds of publications, a handful of podcasts. Now, once these interviews are published, we collect all those assets. I track them all in a track sheet and look at which are the best ones that content wise would make sense to, to really start warming up cold leads as well. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at what can you put on social? What can you put in your autoresponder? What will you just send out as a broadcast news email? What are some of the things that you should definitely use as ads? And then their team or, or their marketing agency, whoever they're working with, implements that side to actually use that content for the advertising side. Mm, got it. Interesting. Okay, so if like someone wanted to do this, uh, like where where would you suggest someone to start who's listening with publicity? You know, maybe they haven't been on a podcast or been featured anywhere, but they're really wanting to. Where should okay. they kind of go? So the first thing, and nobody likes to hear this, is to start building your relationships first. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to go to a really popular podcast like, you know, Smart Passive Income or whichever really big one you want to be on and say that, hey, I, I just started my business yesterday. I want to be on your show. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work like that. Like, first of all, there has to be a story. There has to be something that is proven where you have a track record, where you have some kind of transformation that either you've gone through yourself, let's say if you're just first starting out in your business, or you have clients that you're able to produce these results for. Mm -hmm. And then what I would recommend is start connecting with podcasts for sure with the smaller shows first. Now I'm not talking about the tiny ones. And and for those of you guys who have very new podcasts, just bear with me here <laughs> because <laughs> in the podcast industry, there is even a, a a phrase for this called pod fade uh -huh. you know where people who get excited about the idea of podcast but it's, it's just general with any content marketing right they do it for a couple of months three months and then they're done yeah and then you know you don't want to be in a position as the guest to do those interviews on those very new shows that really hard to have any audiences if at all and then potentially your interview never even gets published right so right. one of the things that we always look at when i book my clients on shows is to make sure that it's at least a mid-sized show or if it's smaller or if it's newer at least three months that they've been um consistently publishing and even with the newer shows, what I like to look at is who is the person who is hosting it? Have they built a successful business before? Mm -hmm. If they have, that's a good sign because we know that they didn't build it. You know, they didn't win that business over, you know, in the lottery. They built it because <laughs> of consistency. Mm -hmm. So so that really helps screen out the good opportunities from the bad ones. So podcasts are really, really good if you have a niche business where it's not a mainstream thing like fitness or weight loss or something that would be interesting to the average person in the street. Uh, podcasts are for sure really, really good for getting leads and sales. And then once you start booking those shows, you know, start with the smaller ones and then work your way up to the bigger ones. But you can start already today with building your relationships, even with the biggest podcasters. And that just simply means like going on iTunes, leaving a review there, joining their Facebook group, supporting them, reaching out, see how you can help them in some way without pitching them anything of what you do mm -hmm. and start building a friendship with them. And then when the time comes, when, when really you have some traction and a proven track record, and if you have a good story idea for their particular audience or good expertise that would be relevant, then pitch yourself for sure. So that would be the first thing, podcast. And then the second thing is that if you're looking for the credibility to have those big name media um, logos on your website and to be able to use that with what we talked about with mm -hmm. in your um, content marketing and in your Facebook ads and everything, then I would look at TV, radio, and then the magazines, depending on your niche. If you're in the business space, obviously, then the Forbes, the Inc. Entrepreneur, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it might be like Elephant Journal, um, Mind Body Green, Medium is easy um, because you can get your own uh, thing there. Yeah. Thrive Global, which is Ariana Huffington's company, you know, after he, she sold uh, Huffington post she started this month so those types of publications that will really really help as well got it yeah so podcasts yeah it seems like even in any niche if you if you get niched down enough i'm sure you know there's probably a show waiting around that has a pretty captive audience uh, oh yeah so. i and i hear this all the time from people who come to me initially to to discuss working together like yeah i did that podcast you know like two years ago and i'm still getting leads from yeah, yeah. 
Totally. It's fantastic because they live forever. It's very much unlike a TV show where you were in the morning news and then it's gone literally the next minute. It's not covered again. Mm -hmm. Although with that, even with the strategies that we talked about, you can get the clip and then use it in your ads. So there's ways to make that evergreen also. Yeah. So what sort of advice do you have for people once they get on a podcast or get into the media? Because I, I mean, I, I can't even count how many times somebody's come on this podcast. And at the end, we say, you know, wh where do you want to send people after listening to this episode? And they're like, oh, they could just go follow me on Twitter. <laughs> you know, they're like, Ooh, is that really the biggest good. benefit you're going to get out of this podcast? <laughs> so what, what do you what do you recommend people do after getting these opportunities? That is such a good question. So for anything that is online media, like a podcast or a YouTube show, Facebook Live interview, people actually expect you to have an offer for that audience. More often than not, it's a free offer. It's not like a JV webinar, but you will have an opportunity to recommend something where they can take the next step. And so the key to make this successful is, well, first of all, start with something that people actually want, right? So you're mm -hmm. not testing this on the podcast, but you've already been running ads through it or tried it organically and you know that this is a piece of content that people want and then make sure that whatever you are giving away whether it's a downloadable cheat sheet or a video series or a quiz or whatever it might be that the topic of that piece of content is relevant to what you talked about in the interview yeah. and with yeah. podcasts it's fairly easy because you have a long time right you have 20 30 minutes or an hour to talk so you can always bring in some of the talking points and then just seed your content and say by the way we have a lot more information about this on our website like you know just like for example about publicity i have a ton of videos on Mm -hmm. on my website and on Facebook and everything, you guys can go there and get more. And then at the end, when they ask specifically, where can we go, then you would give them the link to that landing page. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very different from traditional media where, you know, in a TV interview, you're not going to be able to say that, hey, go to this specific dot com forward slash whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but there you can give them your normal website or they will usually give it for you, just the homepage. And as long as it's optimized and you have a pop up there for some kind of lead capture thing and it's pixeled so that you can retarget them, you'll be able to monetize that that way as well. Gotcha. Now, is there any way for people to know which of these you know, media outlets and podcasts were effective. I mean, do, do you do you recommend people send, let's say, when they go on a podcast, have, you know, a unique URL that they're sending for that podcast so they know which podcast they came from? Or do you just kind of recommend to have a place to send them and you just kind of know that if they come to this page, it came from all of your podcasting? You know right. I mean? So this is a really, really good question as well. And it really depends on where you're at in your business. If you already have a team and you have people who are helping you with a technical setup of separate coupon codes for every single different show or separate something that would be really unique to that, then it makes sense to actually put in that effort. If you already are, let's say, at a multi seven figure level, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. If you're just starting out you can go a little bit more generic because it's unlikely that you will be able that that it will pay for you to track so granularly something that actually doesn't move the needle to you too much until you start putting in the Facebook advertising piece to it. Mm -hmm. In, in that case, what I would recommend is focus more on the story that you want to share. And then you can do general things like what you were suggesting a minute ago with, let's say the, the cheat sheet goes here, the video thing goes there, or you give a unique link that is separate just for generally for podcasts or generally for um, YouTube, for example, or TV. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of how we started off too, because every show we go on, we always have an offer. Typically it's our traffic book, but that will probably change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's worked really well. And, you know, after that, we have some opportunities that people can go deeper by the physical version, a course and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's been the way that like we monetize our appearances on podcasts specifically. Mm -hmm. And, and you're going to ask them anyway, especially because you survey your audience from time to time. So you want to find out where they heard about you for the first time, yeah. which is not always accurate because people like kind of remember, yeah, I heard you on some show, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they could be wrong, but, but at least it gives you an idea. And the other thing too is um, you can also uh, ask people if you have high ticket offers, like for example, if you're doing coaching or a service business like similar to mine, where you don't have it thousands of clients at a time you have just a handful because mm -hmm. there is so much that you can do at capacity you can just ask them that hey uh, who introduced us or what you know how, how did you hear about me first and that way you can track it as well and that works really well you know I, I just one example that comes to mind I was in a 
um, very, not a very small, but like a small ish podcast mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And one of the clients that I got who heard me on the show, he is a CPA and um, estate planning attorney, and he manages literally over $500 million in assets for his clients. So like really a, a serious established business person heard me on a small podcast. So just a simple, uh, you know, he, he yeah. wrote a letter to me and, and everything in a mail and sent me his book and everything. Hey, I would like to work with you. And he told me what show he heard me on. There you go. Yeah. And we hear it all the time, too. Even if we don't prompt it, you know, it'll be a, like I was looking at LinkedIn, I think, what, two days ago, Matt. Mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, we haven't been in LinkedIn in a while. Whoops. And looked at the <laughs> inbox and there were like six messages that were about, hey, I heard you on this show or hey, I, I love this episode. You guys, I'm like, oh. Oops, <laughs> I probably should have been checking this, but yeah, it's amazing <laughs> how many connections have come from us being on other shows mm -hmm. and just yeah. appearing in publicity anywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of publicity, along those same lines, you mentioned TV and radio, and that's that's something that we've never explored. Well, I I was on a radio show once, but that's it right. was a, a, a our buddy ran the radio show, so we had an, an in already. But um, <laughs> relationships that is <laughs> true. true that is true i guess that just uh, proves the point of building all these relationships but how how let's say somebody doesn't have connections in radio or tv how would how would somebody approach trying to get on radio or tv Okay, so one thing that you can do is just the same as we talked about is start building those relationships early. Now with news based media like TV and radio, it's not as important, although it's of course always good if they know you and see you as a reliable resource, but mm -hmm. you would build that over time. So uh, there it's more important to tag into something that the media is already interested in. So something like an upcoming holiday or a local event, or, you know, we just had Mother's Day, that would be a really good one. Or sometimes mm -hmm. um, there is a, a theme for the month, like October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, or um, April just now was a Stress Awareness Month. And I had several of my clients who, who can speak to stress from a health perspective, and we use that as a news peg. Mm -hmm. Or another one of my clients who, uh, there was a trending news uh, story in the Canadian media Media, all about how only 20% of women or less than 20% of women actually make it to the corporate boardroom. And my wow. client is a, uh, is a business coach, so she can speak to that. But we were using something that the media is already interested in with a fresh angle. So here the, the key is ask yourself, not necessarily how can I promote my stuff here, but what are the skill sets that I have that make this service or product that I have possible. Like, for example, if you're a sales expert, maybe some of the things that you're really, really good at is building rapport really quickly or gaining people's trust or, um, you know, handling uh, objections or getting people to see your point of view. Like, those are the skills. Now, how can I create a strong new story with talking points that would be interesting to a general audience? Because we are not in the beginning, we're not talking about getting on Bloomberg or, or CNN News. You mm -hmm. have to start with a local TV. So what can I do that would be interesting to the general public in a way that ties into a trending story or an upcoming event? Put the two together and pitch it that way. Mm, got it. Yeah, and I see that I see that you've gone on many TV shows, uh, you know, news stations, what up there in LA a lot on your website. I saw. Um, how yeah. do you how do you know like? Is there a way to gauge? Are you looking at specific stations or times? Obviously, the topics, that's a great one. I love that, where you can kind of pair up your pitch to a, a theme that's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is Perfect. there a way that, like, do you actually, like, pick and choose specifically the station and all that stuff to try to get the results you're looking for? Or is it just trying yeah. to be there? So um, with TV, it's a little different than with podcasts because with podcasts, you can, of course, choose any of, for example, any of the entrepreneur shows, mm -hmm. right? There's literally thousands of them versus with TV, there's maybe five stations within a city, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's ABC, NBC, CBS, you might have Fox, maybe you, like, depending on how big the city is, right? So uh, some might just have one. So what I would emphasize in, in that kind of a situation is that you're a local expert and local would count within a couple of hours of driving distance. So if you're living in a really small town, but you're you know, just on the outskirts of, of a bigger city where they have a TV station, you could pitch for there. And then what I would look at is how can I emphasize why it's important to do this story now. So you don't want to choose an evergreen topic, but something that has a fresh angle with something that's timely right now and pitch it to all those local shows for now. And then you'll follow up with them, you know, in the following week, following two weeks to make sure that one of them actually books you. Mm -hmm. And then 
next time, maybe a month later, you will have a, another story idea and you'll pitch the remaining outlets and then cycle through them, you know, and then when, as you start getting bookings, you can come back to the original one, pitch another story, maybe like once every three months or so, if you're staying local, if you're traveling, if you already have speaking gigs booked or for whatever other reason, you're going to another t city, then you can pitch yourself for that one as well. Mm, got it. And how do we get on Ellen? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so that's a really good question actually so <laughs> what you want to do because with national tv shows and we've got clients on national tv shows as well the producer there is not in a position to actually book you unless they know for sure that you're first of all someone who can speak in sound bites who has interesting mm. content to that audience and who's also able to work in a very, very fast-paced environment because a TV interview is a minute and a half to two minutes, right? Five minutes tops. And that includes the questions mm -hmm. that you really have to know how to share your message in a very succinct and entertaining way. So what they look at when they start looking at who would be potential guests is what kind of TV have you done before? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is why we are starting with your local market. Got it. So the, the local market is kind of like the stepping stones to getting to that someday. Correct. The only exception would be, of course, if you were eyewitness news you know, and it's some like horrible breaking news story. Sure. Yeah. So who, when you're going for TV and radio, is there a specific person there? I, I know you just mentioned producer for someone like Ellen. She, they don't actually do the booking. Is it a producer you're looking for for TV and radio? Yeah, so usually it's either the producer, the segment producer, or the executive producer that you want to talk to, depending on the show and how many producers they have working on that particular media outlet. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing for, for radio also, it's usually, so this is for TV, and for radio, it would be either a producer or a news director that you want to reach out to. Gotcha. gotcha. Now, is it is it ever a good idea to uh, purchase PR? I. Um, and let me preface this. We've actually had a few opportunities come up in the past where people have approached us and said, hey, I can get you into Forbes. It's going to cost you X amount and we'll get an article written up on you in Forbes. We've had that kind of scenario pop up a few times. We've never actually done it. Uh, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on on actually like paying for uh, for getting in the media? My thoughts are don't walk or run. <laughs> 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 so this is typically a scam. Like, first of all, let, let me just clarify. There is paid media that is actually legit versus paid media that is the fishy kind. What you described sounded more like the fishy kind. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. let me it real quickly. So with TV, um, they do have sponsored content where it exactly looks like news. But they will say that this, you know, this segment was brought to you by such and such company. Hmm. So that's something that usually you can do in a smaller TV station locally, and you will pay for that spot, and they will produce it as though it was real news. But legally, they are obliged to say that this was paid content. Hmm. So this is something where you have a very, very uh, competitive topic. Like let's say April fifteenth is the tax deadline, and all the CPAs are pitching themselves for the station. You know, hmm. so then the one that is actually willing to do sponsored content station is going to go with that rather than interviewing them for free because they already have a lot of that type of really legitimate experts might as well make money on it so that's that's the thing where you can do it in, leg in a legit way but generally speaking i recommend against it because the whole point of media is to build trust and in order to build trust it's, it's imperative that you didn't just buy that spot mm. you really are doing it based on merit right what you described there with the Forbes articles, actually Forbes and um, Entrepreneur and all these big business publications, they do have a section where you can advertise in the magazine. And it may look like an article, but it's going to say at the top that it's an advertisement. Mm -hmm. They have to legally say that. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about, though, is where they have writers who are uh, columnists who write for the mag magazine who have been pre-approved already. And, you know, they have to still pitch the topic to the uh, uh, editor, but most of the time it just goes through without anything. And sometimes, but they don't get paid for it, right? Forbes has changed just recently because before they had a lot of contributing writers that were not paid. Now they let a lot of them go and now they pay everybody. But then also those, those people are evaluated based on traffic and how many clicks they're getting for the article. So that's something to consider as well when you're pitching your story. Like, really, is it newsworthy? Is it something that people want, right? Interesting. But yeah. as, as far as the unpaid contributing writers making money on the side, that's a really, really, not even gray, but more like a <laughs> black area because, <laughs> because they, it's actually against the terms of the publication. They've gotten yeah. approved to that column for providing content 
based on merit with whoever or whatever they want to cover there, not for secretly getting paid for it. Actually, any of these publications could legally get in trouble. It's a liability for them because they're not disclosing that this is technically an ad. And plus, they're not even profiting from it. Right? Mm, <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't make a sense on any level. And very often, these guys get found out and then the column entirely or the article at least entirely gets removed. Now you're out of $10,000 and <laughs> you have actually don't have anything to show for it. So yeah, yeah. the other scammy way that sometimes people I've seen do it is where they just do a press release through one of the paid press release services and they say that now I've been featured in you know ABC <laughs> and, people, and actually right. they never had an interview. So <sighs> that's that's not the way to do it. You actually want to have real interviews. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, Think about it. Go ahead. I was going to say it's just kind of the difference between native advertising, which is okay and wild, widely accepted as long as you're disclosing, and earned media and basically purchasing earned media. If you purchased it, it wasn't earned media. Right. It's an yeah. advertisement. Yeah. And yeah. that's, yeah. we would have got a deal, Matt. That was 2K is what we were pitched. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we pitched just 2K to be in Forbes. <laughs> no, but that's true. Yeah. And we were like, this seems not right. Oh, and yeah. Then, and then we asked around. We're like, oh, yeah, it's against the terms. I'm like, yeah, I could see why. Yeah. Well, if you're doing something media worthy, then, you know, contact the media and let them sure. know and they'll decide if it's media worthy or yeah, not. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's the other thing too. Forbes actually has a whole other section, which is a separate company called mm -hmm. Forbes Coaches Council, where a lot of entrepreneurs are able to apply to that, assuming that they have at least a seven figure business. And I forget what their exact uh, guidelines are, but they have a certain set of criteria that you have to pass through and then pay to be a part of this coaches council where now then they guarantee that you are published say five times a, a year or something like that. Like you have a few articles a year, mm -hmm. but the thing is because it's in the page side, it's actually not Forbes, right? It just sounds like it. They're affiliated with them and it's called Forbes coaches council, but it's not the actual Forbes magazine. So, uh -huh. um, you know, so it's, it doesn't a lot because average consumer wouldn't know, but, Anybody just you look in the in the URL in the address bar and you see that it's not the actual real Forbes magazine, yeah. and and it doesn't get ever shown in the main website. So if you're looking for the big level of credibility and being featured as a lead article, it's not going to happen with that. And the other thing too is being featured in these types of outlet in these like side dish outlets. Um, you'll kind of have a real hard time with actually ever getting be being featured in Forbes because they already saw you over there and they know that you're willing to pay for it. Gotcha. Yeah. So. I'm I'm kind of curious. It's so I've heard we have friends, we know people who have been on things like Ellen and like the uh, Good Morning America and the Today Show and things like that. And you know they they did it to coincide with a book launch or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And they've they've pretty much everybody I've talked to that have been on these nationally televised shows have said that it didn't move the needle on their book sales nearly as much as they thought it would, and that things like podcasting, like podcasts actually move the needle way more for them. So I'm curious, when somebody does get national attention, what is the best way to leverage that media? How, how do you make sure you're getting the best uh, mileage out of that appearance? I like it. So this is what you have to consider. So for example, if you're on the Ellen show or on the Today show, you're going to reach a couple of million people who have most likely for the most part have never ever heard of you, right? Mm -hmm. So they're basically totally cold. Now you might have a c excellent media training where you are really entertaining and a wonderful guest and the book is something that appeals to the masses. It really is the kind of, you know, book like we, we talked about earlier with weight loss or fitness or something that a lot of people would be interested in, or maybe a personal development book, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that, where it really is interesting, not just to a small section of the population, you will definitely see a spike in your uh, traffic to your website. And then it's up to you and your sophisticated digital marketing strategies to follow up through them because all they saw was one time. It's just like when you have a, a physical product, you know, in an e-commerce store, what you have a 1% conversion, it's not like 99% of your, of your visitors will go away after one and then you retarget them and start getting them back, mm -hmm. especially if they've gone through the, even to the step of, in your funnel where they would maybe put a, the product into the car. So if it's something like that where they have a book launch, what I would look at is how can I leverage this? Take, take that video clip and now use it as a Facebook ad and retarget everybody who already expressed some level of interest through your Facebook fans, through your email list or anything else, and then put this Ellen Show episode or Today Show episode in front of them to get those guys to buy. Mm. The other thing that you can do is take this video clip and a couple of others, ones that you have together, 
and make a media reel out of it. First of all, put it on your website. It's a huge credibility builder. Secondly, you can use it to get speaking gigs at really high level conferences. Or if you're the kind of speaker who likes to speak at Fortune 500 companies, mm. this is something that will really, really help with that as well because they see you as someone super, super credible. That's super smart. Now, with that. is there any sort of uh, copyright implications? Like, what is the legalities of using clips from something like Ellen or the Today Show on your website? Okay, so I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, it's if you think about it, it's uh, the benefit uh, of the show. It benefits the show as well. The more you advertise it and promote it, the, the more views they will get generally to the show as well. So I've never had an issue with that as far as putting it up on my YouTube channel or Facebook or on my website or anything like that. None of my clients had either uh, because it actually helps the show as well. I will say that one thing that that actually got pulled down once from Facebook was, do you guys remember when United Airlines had that huge scandal where they dragged a doctor <laughs> up? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, So it was a huge trending national news story. And I went on, on TV in New York City to talk about it, like how can the airline handle it from a publicity perspective? Now, in the B-roll, while they were interviewing me, they showed that viral clip that one of the passengers uh, taped with, with his uh, cell phone. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of the story. And that was embedded in the entire interview as a mm -hmm. video clip. So I put it up on Facebook. It was living there fine for like a year. <laughs> and then suddenly I, I get a notification from Facebook that the, the company that bought up that viral news clip, that little insert in it mm -hmm. of the passengers, they, they were claiming copyright. It wasn't the news station. Uh, <laughs> wow. the news. So someone owned yeah. that clip and then they're yeah. like, hey. Wow. And, you know, and so I responded, you know, that I disputed it. And I said, that, look, I was interviewed on TV about this specific story. They used it on such and such channel. It was on the CW and PIX11. And, and this was a legitimate news interview that I was interviewed for on this story. And then they let it go and they let me keep it. Wow, so. that's cool. So basically, yeah. You're, yeah, you're taking any clips that you find published online. Do you ever have to reach out to these local stations or anywhere to get a clip? Uh, you can most of the time when they confirm that they want to do an interview, they will say if they don't have it or they not it's not available. They'll say that we don't provide clips, whatever. Mm -hmm. you put a your know, DVR ready. Usually, what we do is I tell my clients, don't worry about it because I'm going to reach out to them on your behalf after you've done the interview. Got what they want to avoid is the guests are hanging around there. The producers have a lot of things to do, and then you're sure. just like, oh, can you burn my DVD? It doesn't work that way. But usually, you can get it. And if they're not able to give it to you or they don't put it on the website, but you could just do a screenshot right of like a screen flow video capture mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that there's a lot of uh, these paid services like scission or uh tv uh tv news clips i think it's called but like for 60 uh for 60 bucks you can tell them the time when you were on that interview the time and date and the station and they'll be able to pull it up and get it to you ah so they have records of all that stuff yeah got it everything is being recorded everywhere <laughs> <laughs> that's true and now podcasts are more so by Google and like we we're just reading how they're okay. going to start transcribing and basically molding podcasts into search results. So anything you say here, it's being recorded. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's a really good point too for, for, for the guys listening here is doing a lot of interviews, podcasts especially is really useful for your SEO over time as well. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> If, if you look up your names, you guys, or, or my name, just put it in, the website will be the first one in the social media pages. But after that, you see page after page after page of yeah. podcast interviews because a lot of people put in your bio, your transcript of the interview, a little bit about you. There's an actual web page created, not just the audio on iTunes. That's true. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's an amazing way to grow a brand for yourself, even just to look credible. It's like get on like 10 shows, 10, 20 shows. It doesn't take much. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, sooner or later, once those things are published, give it a, maybe a month or two. It's like you're going to yeah. see yourself popping up all over the place and, and maybe yeah. any previous things, maybe some old pictures or something from prior business days. You're like, I don't really want those in Google. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a reputation management. Yeah, we actually, <laughs> we, you know, we set up a, a Google alerts for our brand name, our podcast name and our own personal names. So we get, you know, Google alert emails that tell us anytime we're mentioned on a site or any, you know, a lot of podcasters, um, I'm, I'm going to. I'm just going to say it. A lot of them are lazy. They won't even like email us when our episode goes live, which I think I is know. just a Very shame lazy. because you're missing out on a potential marketing opportunity from us. But saying that, we do get the Google alerts, so we do see when a lot of our episodes go live. And we do a, a weekly roundup email that we just mail our whole list. So whenever we go on somebody else's podcast, we actually mail our list with here's all of the 
shows we were featured on this week. Yeah. And, I love and, that. I wish all my clients did that. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to give a value add to anybody who brings us on their podcast. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, as, as a podcaster, it's really a huge opportunity as well, because I feel like it goes either way, either they completely forget to even tell you or it goes months and months goes by before they even publish it. And then they just mention it once on Facebook, mm -hmm. instead of actually capitalizing on it and sending the guest an email that hey, it's coming out next week, hey, it's coming out tomorrow, you know, and then on the day off, and thank you so much, and then tagging them multiple times, you know, who does it really, really well. Um, do you guys know Dan Cushell from Growth Oh, Studios? yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's been on the show. We've been on his show. <laughs> yeah, he's oh, a good. beast with yeah. his follow-ups. <laughs> I did his show, I think, maybe a year and a half ago or something. To this day, I still get tagged. Because he, they, yeah. his, they've created so many image quotes and, like, different pieces of content that they just constantly push out on Twitter and for all of their guests, not just for me. And it's really, really incredible. It's true. And it, yeah. it makes you feel good. And also, as, as the person, like, in this case, Dan is top of mind for me. So anytime I have something that would be or someone that would be a good introduction to Dan, not only as a guest for his show, but maybe something for his one of his products or services, I'll definitely make that connection for him. Do you get the uh, direct mail? From him as well? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like he's he's everywhere. And he's on top of it. <laughs> that's what we're actually, Matt and I have been scheming up some ways to follow up with our guests in many ways. Already we're sending t-shirts to a lot of them yeah. and yeah. Uh, are pretty much everyone, but you know, there's a whole process, but we're thinking, you know, postcards and all these like little, little gad custom things we'll have made. I'm not going to say too much because, you know, I <laughs> spoil the fun, but yeah, the follow up. <laughs> What's that? Can I get a t-shirt? Of course you can. <laughs> Look at that. See, that's how it's done right there. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but when we do, when we book our guests for our show in the actual intake form, we ask for an address and shirt size. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I didn't remember that. I guess I, I must have filled it out. <laughs> See? Oh, you definitely did. Yeah, we have your address and your t-shirt size. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's part of the intake form. Um, <laughs> so we actually, we send stuff to our guests. I mean, we, we want to make it so people want to be on our show as much as possible. And when we go on other people's shows we want to make it so people really want us on their shows so yeah. we market the heck out of our shows we thank the heck out of our guests that come on our shows when we go on other people's shows we do the same stuff we try to send them cool stuff we try to promote the episode that they brought us on you know we, we do whatever we can to to make it a win-win all around every single time and i think that's mm -hmm. kind of the reason we get on so many podcasts and we have so many great guests on our show yeah, and, and then this is part of building relationships because it's not only like pinging everybody every five minutes on Facebook. It's actually leading with action. So what 100%. you guys are doing and what Dan is doing, it's, it's really building relationships with people. Yeah. yeah. We got Dan's a, a great one to model too. <laughs> That's doing it right. <laughs> we actually got a lot of inspiration from him specifically. So I love that he brought him up. Yeah. He's yeah. just a good guy. We, we, we had the opportunity to spend a day in a mastermind with him and it was just a mastermind of, of peer podcasters. There was what, 50 podcasters, like that, 48 yeah. podcasters. And it was just a mastermind of 48 podcasters. And out of all everybody there, I think Dan was one of the most impactful, like here's the way to do it kind of guys <laughs> that oh, yeah. we just took yeah. the most from. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. And his is also a radio show, a terrestrial radio show. So he covers all, all bases. Oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't know okay. that either. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know because I book guests on his show and it always has to be on a Wednesday at 10 a.m. Arizona time. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, he's out. I do remember him yeah. taking like commercial breaks in the middle of the show. So now it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> oh, so it's like syndicated then, huh? Yeah, that's all interesting. Right. I, I, that's another question I've always I've always wondered. Maybe, maybe you know the answer to this. Maybe this isn't your expertise. But I've, I've always been curious how podcasters actually end up getting their shows syndicated over the radio is that something that you know how they do or is something you're involved in at all i don't know i know a couple of people who have done that so i'm happy to make an introduction for you guys if you <laughs> want to learn about this to do this for yourself like for example jim beach i know that's yep, it from yep, a school yep, of yep. startups do you guys know him we yes. know jim yep yep we okay, haven't been on so his show or anything but we do know him yeah you know what? His show is syndicated in 24 different AM and FM stations, mm -hmm. as well as all the online platforms. So he has now over 200,000 listeners a day for his show. Yeah. No, yeah. he's he's crushing it. Yeah. It's what we learned. I'm, I'm not going to He's got a pretty sweet specific. sponsorship with Wells Fargo, too. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, I mean, it's it's not a secret. It's yeah. like you can hear it on his show. <laughs> no, he's, he's doing well. Yeah. I think it's all the radio syndication part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. I, I don't know if we'd ever get syndicated on the radio because... We cuss like sailors on a lot of our episodes, but, uh, you know, you, mean you know what, that, that's, that's something I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's good for, for our listeners to know as well as a guest. Okay. Uh -huh. So, 
Uh, this is something that just again comes back to legalities besides the personal taste of the, mm -hmm. the show host is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the radio shows are regulated by the FCC. So you can't actually FCC, right? So you can't actually say things like that because that station is going to get fined. Yeah, right. And depending on how big of a market they're airing their show at, depending on what time of day it is, like how many listeners they really expect, it could be as much as $50,000 per occurrence. Wow. Yeah. That's 10 times on a show that's a half a million dollars. Yeah, this is <laughs> why I love podcasting because yeah, at the <laughs> time it's not regulated. Yeah, and I, I don't think any, uh, I, I don't think radios will be too happy with us, with the our radios. current, yeah. the, the radios. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't well, think they'd know, be too happy with our current uh, format just with uh, the way we talk sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's another thing too. And as a guest, it's good to know just as, as a courtesy, as the person who is hosting the show, even if it's a podcast where technically there there is no laws or regulations against it, yeah. just ask what is the audience like. I know a lot of YouTubers are really super aware of that as well because Google is so family friendly. Mm -hmm. They will even be out if, if somebody says something like that, even though they're not required, but they want to do well by their audience and then also for their own search results. So uh, one thing that you can do is like, I, I have, for example, one of my past clients is someone who F-bombs are flying out every second mm. of her mouth, mm. but when her kids are around, she's talking like a little angel. Wow. So it's really just a matter of self-awareness. How does she do that? That sounds like that sounds like <laughs> me actually. I've got two little kids too and like when when it's when I'm in business mode and we're meeting networking with people and we're on the podcast and we're doing stuff like that, I have no filter when, when I'm around the kids, the filter's on. Yeah, no, I guess it's just some embedded thing and I saw that yeah, we can kind of do that. I do have this theory about podcasting and radio that we are going to just over time just see them merge. They're just going to become one industry over time. Um because you're already like, kind of seeing it where podcasts are getting syndicated over the radio. You're already seeing pretty much every radio station on the planet is repurposing their radio episodes into podcasts now. And I think what you're going to find is you're just going to find that those two industries are just going to eventually merge and it's just going to be one industry. Mm -hmm. But well, uh, I'd, be, I'd be really curious to see how it goes because there is something to be said, you know, for traditional um, training as far as being a broadcast journalist, mm -hmm. right? So a, a certain level of skills to do interviews that is required on radio. That's maybe not something that is a requirement for podcasters, which mm -hmm. is cool in the sense that everybody can do a podcast if you just decide. It's really inexpensive and fairly simple to set up yeah. you know, on a technical uh, standpoint, right? It's not like you have to have a big studio and, and the whole shebang for doing a radio show. At the same time, you know, the, not just the, the, the interview skills, but also, for example, what you were saying with Dan doing the commercial breaks on an in a, in a, uh, four times during that one hour that he interviewed you, that's something that is also a skill as an interviewer, knowing that in the next five seconds, I got to go to a commercial break. So I'm not going to let my guest go on and ramble. True. So that's something where I, I think it's possible that the two will merge, but podcasters have to step up, their, step up their game to be able to participate in that and become really, really good interviewers. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Dan, you're I right. That way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dan, I, I do remember now, he was extremely polished. Yeah. And I was just thinking, of his style and you just reminded me he it was very deliberate he's polished he knows what he's doing he has this schedule he knows yeah. when the commercials are coming we had no i mean we knew they were they would come but we're like okay yeah no he had he's it led us well you, you know, could tell yeah. he knew the timing of everything very well and he knew when to when to you know switch topics and when to move on and yeah it was, mm -hmm. it was good yeah. i have a question about uh your thoughts on how like when someone goes on TV or any of these other formats that aren't podcasts where it's a long form uncut media typically like you said obviously having a good story having a good transformation moment or something to relate that way but the whole soundbite talk like how does someone train to speak in sound bites do you have some it's, some principles yes. around that <laughs> yeah. so it's it's just practice i have two two tips there one is just very quickly the technicality of a soundbite is basically they ask you a question and you answer the question in a way that part of your response includes the question as well. So they ask you, where did you go to school? I'm not going to say in Paris. <laughs> I'm uh -huh. going to say I went to school in Paris. 
you know? Mm. And so you repeat it a little bit, or I went to such and such school in Paris, uh, as an example. And the reason you do that is because you make the editor's job so much easier with cutting out content that they can then use for teasers, they can use for later repeats, because they can take that entire sentence that makes sense without the context of having to watch the entire interview. Got it. Right? Yeah. So that's important because once you start using these TV clips to pitch yourself for other TV stations or national news media, and they see that you're well-trained, you're entertaining, you're not looking at the camera, you're looking at your interviewer, et cetera, all of those things are important so that they have the confidence to book you on those really, really big outlets. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, as far as the content, you're not going to be able to share your whole story of this is how I came to be and this is my big long entrepreneurial journey journey in a two minute TV interview and that's not the point anyway. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is think about what is my goal with this interview? Am I going to talk about a particular event that is coming up? Maybe you have a conference that is in town and you're promoting ahead of time and, and local TV stations or uh, maybe you have a book that's coming out, you know, and you want people to buy, of course, you will, with that kind of thing, you will be able to have the book there. Or if you have a physical product, often they will include that as well, because they like when it's not just a talking head interview, but there mm -hmm. is something that's visual to that. And then uh, what you want to do is think about, okay, these are my goals. Here are the three to five talking points that I want to cover. These are the most important things that will be important for the audience not only so that they get educated and they get entertained, but also that they want to take the next step with you. So it just goes mm -hmm. back to asking yourself ahead of them, what do they need to hear and believe in order to want to move forward? And how can I help them go in that direction? Got it. I like that. That's Very perfect. Cool. Good, good advice there. Well, before we wrap up, I want to, I want to ask a little bit about your business and, and sort of what you what you look for in your clients because I know you mentioned that you kind of work with a, a very sort of small group of clients so that you can really work hard for the the small handful of clients that you do have what what sort of criteria are you looking for what what makes the ideal client for your actual service business where you help people get on more shows and get in the media yeah so I work with experts who are coaches consultants speakers authors thought leaders, usually they have a very, very strong internet marketing component to their business. It may not be just limited to courses because like, for example, with Ryan Levesque, who you guys are going to interview in just a little bit today. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of my clients. He has a book, but he also has an online course and live events and a software product and a mastermind, like all those different things. It's important that that part of the business is dialed in before they come to me or before they hire a publicist in general. It's really, really important that you have something where you can monetize it, right? If you just have your freebie and it's your very first venture into entrepreneurship, it's not bad to have the credibility and to have those interviews, but you're not going to immediately monetize it if you don't have a solid business structure mm -hmm. on the back end. Mm -hmm. So with Ryan, I, I worked with him on his last book launch for Ask. We worked on it for 11 months and you know he ended up making over $1.8 million per year to his business directly from the podcast interviews that we booked him on. Wow. And it's, it wasn't just the books, obviously, it's the back end sales. So ideally, it's it's people similar to Ryan. He's a good example who, who have a strong business who have a really good track record a good reputation they have a good story to share and they're eager to get more credibility or they want to build buzz for an upcoming launch gotcha cool yeah and thank you for introducing us to ryan by the way that's mm -hmm. super oh, yeah. cool yeah we're, <laughs> we're stoked to have him we've loved his books too so it's uh he's gonna be a good fit here for the audience and yeah. um I'm, I'm curious about like just for so well Actually, where's the best place for folks to reach out and learn more about you? I want to make sure. We get yeah, you can connect with me through my website. It's borntoinfluence.com, B-O-R-N-T-O, borntoinfluence.com, which is, by the way, I realize now that, you know, <laughs> and sometimes I had to give out my email address in stores and something like born to influence is so easy for our industry. And then everywhere else is like, what was spelling for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've done it even with evergreen profits. I'm like, it's. <laughs> It's just two words, but still, it's like, wait, what? It's not well, Gmail. The, the worst is when you when you have entrepreneur in your business oh, name because if you're oh, not an entrepreneur, okay. nobody knows how to spell it. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. is true. <laughs> that and and so, if, you know, like some of the things that you can do, there's a lot of free content on our website as well. And there is a quiz yeah. that you can take to see whether or not publicity is right for you at this stage. And it's super, super easy. It's 12 questions, very fun. And it will give you a really good idea of what makes sense for you as far as building your credibility and getting in the media. That's awesome. Yeah. So we'll link that in the show notes, born to influence.com. I'm, I'm curious, what, 
Like what big thing or, or like challenging venture are you working on yourself? Like are you are you trying to shape something new in the PR world or is there something else that you're personally really kind of Yeah, up personally. On? So <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing yoga for the last couple of months, which I, all my life I hated to exercise, but I'm determined <laughs> to get my splits back. So <laughs> I'm really going for it. And I started to work nice. it up and now I'm actually taking up contortion training. So Whoa, that's contortion <laughs> training. Really? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Wow, that's <laughs> that's amazing. What goes in? So yoga is a first good start. It seems like get all bendy. And yeah, stuff. <laughs> I mean it was good for a couple of months. I, I actually I'm taking up this training not only because I want to really learn contortion, but also because I want to do it safely. I've mm-hmm. had an injury from a dirt biking accident a couple of years ago, and so anyway, uh, the coach that I found is really world class, and she works with a physiotherapist who worked with the Chinese Olympic team and you wow. know and Cirque du Soleil, and so they'll be able to create a custom training plan for me to do it in a way, um, you know, if, if just as, as the example with the splits, if you watch YouTube videos on how to get your splits, uh-huh. most of them, what they teach you is to stretch this way, stretch that way to relax into it and let gravity do the work. And that's actually something where you can really set yourself up for injury. Uh-huh. And so the, the trainers that I'm going to be training with are people who teach you how to always flex or engage the opposing muscles of the ones that you want to stretch. So it's a much safer way. And also you're building strengths for later when you want to do more complicated tricks where you really need a lot of body strength to be able to do it. Wow. That's, I'm, I'm still just getting over the fact of contortioning. Like, <laughs> Cause I, every time I see a contortionist, like a professional, I'm just like, I, I want to go throw up or something like i just well, like, I i'm can't... not gonna perform with it but it's it's just that i like to see oh what my, my body can do it's <laughs> impressive really i mean cool. i'm just like i don't know how that's possible i am not bendy but I mean, there's <laughs> hope for me if i ever wanted to. <laughs> the yoga <laughs> thing though I'm, I'm all about the yoga idea now the, 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 there's a question that, that comes right from our buddy brad costanzo and he asked it on all of his podcasts but yeah. i don't think he's recorded a podcast in like three months so we're kind of stealing it and taking it over but is there any is there any sort of nut that you're trying to crack in your business right now that maybe us or our audience can help you with oh you know what yes <laughs> talk to brad and tell him to come back and do his show <laughs> we, har- we harass him almost daily and it doesn't work so maybe he needs to hear from other people hey listeners like just reach out to brad he's at a uh, you know bacon wrap business just harass him yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we actually had lunch with brad yesterday so we were giving him crap as recently as yesterday <laughs> but you know the, the one it's not really enough to crack but it's like continually continuous development and effort i'm always looking to connect with more podcasters and people who write for the business publications like forbes and income entrepreneur i like Mm. to develop those relationships further and and connect with those types of folks awesome yeah we could do that and anyone listening definitely reach out to esther go check her out at the website born to influence.com that's right and go help her out and we'll help you out too of course (laughs) (laughs) um awesome well I think that's uh oh you know really just a, another wrap up question. What's a good book that you just find yourself referring to often or or recommending to others? Yeah, a really good one that completely changed my life is "Never Eat Alone" by mm. Keith Ferrazzi. Do you guys know that book? Uh huh. Yep. I have not read okay, it. Okay, so uh, it's, it's all about how to build your relationships, how to connect with other people. And I'm a super introvert person. Like until three months ago, I literally used to live in the live in the desert in uh, California. You're an you know, introvert. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. And I don't have PR. to leave the house for four days. I don't leave. Yeah. Well, you sound like me. That's how I am. <laughs> I just, I love it. And I, I love that you're an introvert and that you're doing this work, you know? It's- I love connecting with people, um, you know, in either in person or through online. Um, when it's a small group, like one or two people or maybe four or five. But when it's a big event, I'm happy to go and speak at conferences. And I spoke at like six events last year. But I don't like the environment of having to be amongst hundreds of people people mm. for days and then that really exhausts me and i think a lot of people mix up being introvert with with this in the sense of being exhausted when your energy gets drained when you're in, in around a lot of people versus being shy that's a little bit of sure. a different thing sometimes they can overlap but it's really not the same thing that yeah. is true yeah as a fellow introvert i agree yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, i'm the same way when i go to when i go to a conferences and there's a lot of people around i just i it, it drains me that doesn't mean that i don't enjoy networking and meeting more people i mean i, mm-hmm. I would say i'm a fairly well connected person despite being an introvert mm-hmm. and it, and you know you, a, a, from a connection perspective you probably probably have 10x the connection that I do but uh very cool it's cool it's fascinating so never eat alone we'll link that as well and uh anything else Esther before we wrap up here 
Well, thank you guys so, so much. I really enjoyed doing this interview with you and I really can't wait to share it when it comes out. Yes. And I'm very, very much looking forward to working with you guys more in the future as well. Maybe we can have more guests on the show too. Yeah, awesome. we will for sure. Thank you very much for everything you've done for us and your time here too. So thank you. We'll do it again. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flow Chart podcast. <laughs> For taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out, all the good stuff from this episode. We actually have a nice, simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com. Find this episode that you just listened to and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening. Go get it. Mm.